Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Sybil, and I'm an alcoholic. And by the time this thing is over, I will be perky and bright and shiny and sparkling, and uh, I won't have cotton wool in the head, and um, I'm just not a morning person. Most of you people that know me, and Matt in particular, who drove us down, uh, will tell you that I am not very sharp until about noon. But that's not because of advancing age. I never was. I always did sleep in. I never did like to go to a morning meeting. I do, but I sit when I do, and that's easy to do compared to being up here. And supposed to tell you something about the way it was in the old covered wagon days of Alcoholics Anonymous and how it came about that our traditions were born. Can you imagine such a thing from an ex? This is my, uh, the way I spent my earlier years. Uh, an ex-taxi dancer, ex-bootlegger, uh, uh, secretary, real estate broker, a fruit tramp, picked fruit going all the way up to Oregon, apples, depending on what was ripe at the time, grapes down around Fresno, and so on, peddling door to door, milk, coffee, whatever. Uh, a good job and a bad job, and a chambermaid over in Catalina so that I could uh, enjoy Catalina, uh, clean the room so that I could go out on the beach and get a good tan, didn't matter. Sandwich factory, made sandwiches. I know how to make Bob's sandwiches in less than one minute. I can make four or five. Just lay out the bread, put the peanut butter on one side, the jam on the other, wham them together, wrap them up in foil, and here you are, Bob. And that's it. I can do all those things. But I, in those earlier days, I couldn't quit drinking. And um, I tried very hard for 17 years. And as a great many of you know, I was fortunate enough to find AA in March of um, 1941 because of the Jack Alexander Saturday Evening Post article. I was in a Turkish bath, so bring up once again, wondering why I behaved the way I did and wanting with all my heart to be a good wife and mother because I had a good husband who was providing for me extremely well and taking care of my little daughter that he had adopted. And now my, my drinking had progressed to the point that I I had attempted suicide on many occasions and uh, the geographic cure and everything but sanitariums because I didn't know about them. And I didn't know about pills. I didn't, and marijuana was just something uh, I ran across once in my brother Texas bootlegging joint. And I smoked one and didn't smoke it correctly and got no buzz, no glow, nothing, just bad smoke. And now, if those things had been prevalent, because I started drinking as a teenager, and I quit when I, I quit drinking when I was 32. I came in AA in March. My 33rd birthday was in May, two months later, which makes me 72 years old this coming May. And I will have been sober 39 years, March the 23rd, coming up. <laughs> You're not applauding me because you're applauding Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was going to add that when I came in, I had to think it over very carefully and agree in my head to do it on an all-time basis with no mental reservations whatsoever because that's the way they opened the meeting then in Los Angeles. This is a regular meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in California where a band of men and women who band together for the purpose of staying sober on an all-time basis with no mental reservations whatsoever. And I sat there shivering and shaking, and I said, what an order. I can't go through with that. <laughs> and I meant it. I really meant it. But I was the first woman on the East Coast. Marty Mann was the first lady on the uh, on the West Coast. Marty Mann was the first lady on the East Coast. She'd been sober nine months when I came in, or thereabouts. And uh, they made a fuss over me after they finally found out I was an alcoholic at that first meeting. They thought I was a wife, and it was a closed meeting, and they told me to wait out in the lobby, and I thought they had excluded me, so I had hysterics. Called up Cliff, very drunk, and demanded that he send an AA ambulance and pick me up. 
Which seemed reasonable because in the Saturday Evening Post uh, article, there was a picture of a very sick man uh, on a stretcher being put in an ambulance and being hauled away. And I was in this church's the steam room, you know, and I thought they were wheeling him off to a hospital. So when I called Cliff to tell him my sad story that I'd gone down to the meeting at the Elks Temple, as Ruth Hawk had asked me to do, she wrote me the letter from New York. In that Turkish bath, I scribbled off a desperate plea after I looked at the article and, you know, turned the pages over, and that's about it. Got the box number at the end and wrote for help. She told me where the meeting was, and I concluded they just wouldn't have anyone who looked like me in their meetings. And I had been rejected and ejected from bars for so many years that, well, I couldn't bear that. And I gave Cliff a bad time and said, send that ambulance and take me to the AA hospital so I can get cured. Well, of course, you know, he straightened me out on that one. But I was never going back because I was hurt. I was wounded. I didn't think there was any hope for me anyway. And I never would have gone back if my brother Tex hadn't come over, insisted on going with me to that next meeting. And I couldn't talk him out of it. And I tried very hard. And that was reverse psychology because I didn't know that he was hurting as bad as I was and that he inside himself knew that he couldn't quit drinking either because he protested very loudly that he could handle it. But he finally agreed that he would go with me to the next meeting sober so they wouldn't be able to peg him a non-alcoholic, which he says, of course I am. And so we did go back to that next meeting. Now, at that meeting, there were about 12 or 14 members. There would have been one more, but Hal was down here in San Diego trying to start AA. Now, Hal still was one of the four men that heard about AA in the county hospital, in the general hospital in Los Angeles in, in, in 1939. Johnny Howe, the psychologist there, who knew very little about this illness, was reading the big red book that Kay Miller, a non-alcoholic wife of an alcoholic, had left for someone to read who cared to, and it happened to be Judge Ben Lindsay who passed it on to Johnny Howe. So Howe Silverton and Barney Haller, Clarence McFadden, a bartender, um, all three of those stayed sober from day one, and uh, Owen Fallon, had an orchestra, the Californian, and I was a dancing fool when I could stand up. And I used to dance to his orchestra all the time, so he was one of the four. He didn't stay. But Hal came down here and had a hard time. Imagine one man going around trying to start a group. And there was nothing in the big book that told us how to start a group. There was nothing to guide those people downtown on how to start a group. And I expect that's why we made all the mistakes we did. And when I went back, Frank Randall, who was leading the meeting, and incidentally, I point out here and now, that Frank Randall and Mark Joseph, they were our leaders and speakers for two years. <laughs> and I loved them deeply, very, very much. But at this meeting, at the end of the meeting now, all of this mail had come in from the Saturday Evening Post, and Frank Randall handed it out according to area. If you lived in San Diego, you got it. If you lived in San Bernardino, you got a lot of 12-step calls. If you lived in Riverside, you got some San Joaquin and wherever, Santa Barbara. But he got down to the last bundle of letters, and he said, I've saved these for Sybil, because she's an alcoholic, the first lady that we've had here, and we've never had any luck with women alcoholics before, so now I'm going to put Sybil in charge of all the women that come in. And, my God, I, I sat there with my arms folded and shaking, and I thought I was down here last week, and I got thrown out, and now I'm in charge. <laughs> so he gave me all those letters, and I went home with him, and my brother Tex came over, and we went to see all those drunks and took as many as we could to the next meeting, and everybody else did the same. So you can imagine that we moved from the Up Temple right away to our permanent meeting place at 2200 West 7th and had about this many with short period of time with microphone and everything. And I'm skulking around in the back and hiding because I can't participate. I had a nervous tick. I was scared witless. I could not participate. So now think about uh, Tradition 1, unity. And our personal recovery depends upon it. Everything that we did then made these traditions today. Now, I'm not saying that California alone was responsible for this, but we know the same pattern followed in Akron and Cleveland and then in Houston when it started, the mistakes that we made. 
In the first place, I was in charge of the women until they almost threw me out. There were a lot of women came in in that first two or three months. And I was, I had my book up there in front, and I was ticking off the names, Margie, and she called on Leah, and Leah, she called on so-and-so, and they all balanced out beautifully. I could look over the crowd, see where all the 12-step calls were and how they were handled, and they had to really be on the sticker. They heard from me, and um, I was on the phone with them and training them all the time, and I was truly in charge until one time a gal walked in the door. She lives in uh, San Juan Capistrano now, and incidentally has never had another drink. She was a Pearl Harbor baby. Came in December 7th, 1941. Kay Riley. She walked in the door. She had six women with her, and they hadn't been cleared through me. <laughs> and there was much disunity about that. Because I, I went up to her, and I challenged her, and I said, where'd you get these women, Kay? They're not in my book. She says, you bet they're not, Sybil. They, they live in Culver City, where I do, and it's quite natural for me to call on women in Culver City that need help. If they want to get sober, I'm going to bring them down here from now on, and I'm never, never going to report to you again. And I tell you, I got tears in my eyes, and I just, I just was shaking like a leaf, and I lost my little job. I knew that. And I went out to Huntington Park to talk it over with my brother, who had stayed sober and had started a group, the hole in the ground. And you know what happened. I went out there to tell him my problems. He said, resign, honey, before they throw you out, and I did. <laughs> Because I was governing. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern, but I was governing. But, oh, that hurt, that hurt, that hurt. Now, the reason Tex was out there at Huntington Park instead of down there at the mother group was because he had been excommunicated. Now, that sounds strange because we had no traditions, you understand, and we could do those things and did those things. There was Tex, excommunicated. He didn't pay much attention. The reason, really, the reason he wasn't down there was because he had a group of his own. The reason that they excommunicated him is he started a group, and that was being disloyal to the mother group. And so they just said, get out of here, and he laughed at him. And when he got good and ready, he came back. And he was the first one to be excommunicated, but not the last. Not the last. I even helped uh, excommunicate or try to excommunicate, in quotes, a young man who would go to a sanitarium and sober up and come back to the door and pass out the cards for the members as they came in. Johnny Miller Sanitarium, $35 a week, all the medication you want, you don't hurt a bit, you don't even have to miss a meeting. <laughs> and we knew, that, now, without any traditions, we knew that uh, we were scared witless. We knew that our program was going to go down the drain with this guy promoting that sanitarium. Everybody get drunk during the week and coming, come back on Friday. He said, look at me. I look pretty good. Well, we put up with that. He had two slips. And when he came back and looking pretty good again and started the card routine, we went up to him and we said, listen, Lee, now you had two slips and we put up with that. But now we just want to tell you right now, three slips and you're out. His name was Lee Fowler. And Harry Chisholm, Pete Cunningham, one or two of the boys said, you can't do that. The boy doesn't know any better. He's happy with the bunch of people here. That's about all he knows at this point. And so if he does drink, he doesn't know anything better than to get sober so he can come back here. We'll try to explain to him that we ought not to, to, to get mixed up with sanitariums and, and stuff like that. And they didn't. It was an instinct. They really hadn't followed it through, but they knew it wouldn't work. They talked to Lee. And he did get sober. And he was one of our most stable, one of the stable younger people in the group at that time. I don't know where he is today, but he never did drink again, to my knowledge. But these were terrible things that we're doing. Uh, this is not a tradition. However, we did uh, used to pass out medication to our 12-step workers. Pete Cunningham would sit there at the table, and Frank would boom out and say, No, those of you who got your 12-step calls tonight, be sure and see Pete before you leave, because... Uh, uh, we want to get those drunks down here by next Friday, and uh, so bring them down any way you can. If you have to give them a pill, uh, Pete will um, fix you up. So Tex and I were a little puzzled, but we went up to the table, and we got our little jug of peralahide, and, and we got two Nimbutal, and we were on our way. <laughs> and that would create quite a lot of disunity today. <laughs> But we didn't know any better until we went back the following Friday. And Frank said, Hear this, hear this before the regular meeting started. One of our members gave a guy a pill. He had a bum ticker. 
and his heart stopped. We called an ambulance. We put him over here in the hospital. He's going to be all right, but we could have killed him. We could have murdered this man. So I want you to hear this and listen good. Come up here and give Pete back your medicine. And we all went up and dumped our purses out on the table. He said, from now on, we're not going to play doctor. We're not going to play nursemaid. We're not an employment agency. We're not going to lend you any money. We're not here to give advice to the loved ones. From now on, we're going to do a very simple thing. We're going to carry, simply carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to those who have a drinking problem and want to get well, period. And now we'll start the meeting. And that's the way it was. And there was no more medicine this then, thank God. But you know, I, I, um, when I think about the mysterious way that I felt about AA when I went to my first few meetings, the word anonymous, I was all aglow with the word anonymous that I was special. The stigma and the shame that I had felt about my drinking was gone because here I am now with a bunch of people. It was a kind of a vision that I had that we would go to meetings with robes on and masks and we would just sit there and say, we're anonymous. <laughs> it was a great feeling. And I'd walk down the street and the neighbors, and I used to put bottles in their cans out in front, you know, so I wouldn't have too many in my own trash can. And I would look at the neighbors as I walked down the street and I'd think, they don't know it, but I'm anonymous. <laughs> I wonder if newcomers today get uh, sort of a feeling like that. I know that I did. It was just a, a very special feeling. And, of course, they petted me and pampered me and let me be in charge and made a fuss over me. And they'd say, how are you doing, Sib? Oh, I'm fine. How long have you been sober? Nine days. Well, great. I, I certainly didn't expect I'd be sober over 30. I didn't even tell my father, who lived with me, until I'd been sober 30 days because that was a lifetime. It was absolutely a lifetime. Uh, it didn't start then, but soon after, as time went by, we got into the habit of saying, we have only one authority, and that's this big book. And we would pet it and pat it. We only have one authority, and that's the big book. And then we were taught that that isn't so. That there's only one ultimate authority from a group standpoint, and it's a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. And our leaders are but trusted servants, and they do not govern. And Bill will know better than I or Cliff or one of the delegates or ex-delegates, and Rosa, who is one also, will remember when we got some material from New York in recent years saying, don't do this, please. I mean, very mildly, of course, because the general service office is always very mild about suggestions, but they did put it plainly, and it, it read very clearly to me that we ought not to say that the book is our Bible and that it's the ultimate authority, that it's truly uh, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. And it was just a habit that we probably started when I first came in because the big book was all that we had, this great big fat red book. Big fat red book. And I have one at home that Jimmy and Rosa gave me on my 20th birthday. And I look at it all the time. And I treasure it. Money could never, never buy it. I, I don't even, I don't even take it to meetings ever. People that come to my home can touch it and see it and read it. And the program is the same, but the drinking stories are different. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Poor Lee Fowler and Tex Adams and all the other people that we tried to throw out. What would have happened if we, if we hadn't really come to our senses and thought the thing through? One guy would be dead that I know in this audience, and that's Bob. I, I met him in 1952, along about the time that my brother Tex died at the hole in the ground. And I had known him, and he'd been a neighbor. And I used to babysit his little kid. And everybody loved Bob at the hole in the ground. But Bob was an atheist, and he'd come down there and argue with us all the time. And he couldn't stay sober. And he'd come to the door a lot of times, and he'd be dirty, but he wouldn't want him to come in. He told me this after we were married. And the, the hole in the ground was in the basement, and so the windows would be at street level, sort of like that. And after the meeting started, he would, he would look through the window and put his ear up against the glass. And he'd think, I can't go down there because there's Sybil talking. And there's Jim Valiant talking. Jim is here today. And all the other people who loved him there and that he knew well. But he'd been in, in and out so often that he could not come in and get the medicine that he needed to stay sober. And he was a lost soul. When he told me that, I just cried. I feel like crying now because 
Surely there are other men and women here who've had relapses and they came in too soon or for the wrong reason and went back to drinking and would have that terrible feeling that I belong back there, the meeting is beginning, I wish I was there instead of here in the bar, but I mustn't go back because I can't bear for anyone to scold me or look down on me and, and they're all successes and I'm a failure. Again, I'm a failure. I was a failure out there, now I'm a failure. I can't stay sober. They feel that way, they're dead wrong. I will speak, and I shouldn't do this, I'll speak for Rosa and Bob and and uh, Pat here and uh, the places that I see, that I believe that if a new man walked in this door, a new man today who was drunk a month ago and has had a lot more trouble, that if he walked in this door today, we would maybe even be happier to see him than a new man or a girl who walked in who had never heard of AA before and had never been drunk after coming to AA because we realize how terribly hard it is for him to come back. I got that all through Bob's eyes. I will say this, until I got that through Bob's eyes, that down at the hole in the ground, slipperoos were given short shrift. They had to sit in the back row and shut up. No, but really, I want to tell you, most everybody stayed sober. We were clinging so desperately to this lifeboat. We were so afraid that we were all going to be tossed back in the drink and drowned together. That if anybody got drunk, I mean, we just looked upon them as, with horror. The first person that got drunk, uh, besides Lee Fowler, that I knew about when somebody said, you know, uh, Phyllis or whoever it was is drunk, I said, no, really? Oh, my God. I, I just thought it, it, it was worse than if they had said she got run over by a truck. I just couldn't believe it. And then, of course, we, we realized then that a lot of mothers, a lot of wives, a lot of judges, a lot of different people, uh, probation departments were making people come in who really wanted to be somewhere else. And that they all come back sooner or later if they live. We don't lose any. So I don't believe in statistics too much. I don't think we know how many we have because we counted ourselves here today and it would go back to the general service office. Try counting us down in Los Angeles. Bill Blake down there be counted in the Wednesday group or whatever and whoever visits L.A. And you know, we could count ourselves over and over and we don't know how many we are and we never will and that's okay. Now... If we do things in AA that will affect AA uh, as a whole or even affect our group, and if we do things, um, we're self-governing, absolutely self-governing, but we ought not to do anything that could possibly hurt AA, and no AA member would do it knowingly, really and truly. But it is such a, a difficult thing when it comes along, and well-meaning AAs will sometimes do these things. I'll give you a, not a very good instance, but it happened. There was a fellow in Texas group that wanted Texas jobs. Let me point out quickly here that if in those days you started a group, you owned it. Uh, uh, let's, let's go to Texas group tonight. No, I want to go to a Duke's group out in Willowbrook. Well, no, how about going over here to Hank's group over in Maywood or wherever? Well, all right. So uh, it, you owned it. And I mean, you really stood your ground, boy, and you didn't get thrown out easily. But this fella, he was all, he was eloquent. He was known as the book. He's been dead many years. He was known as the book because he would get up and make a talk and it would be the book, almost word for word. But you had to be cunning and you had to be well read to detect it because he could start at any chapter and he'd never miss a word. The reason for that, that he was legally blind and his wife had read the book to him so many times that he had memorized the whole thing. So he was known as the book. Very eloquent. Very helpful to everybody, but he wanted the hole in the ground. And he couldn't have it. <laughs> and there was many a fight about that. And so he just went two doors down the street about where that building is right there, and he read it to church. All right. Now, there could have been um, a big gang war there about that. To have that, that, that meeting the same night, who's... They'd be whispering, you know, uh, are you going to Charlie's tonight? No, I'm going to stick here with Tex. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think I'll just come early and, and, and stay for part of Tex's meeting and then go on over and, and, and hear the book talk. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And so this was going on. When I threw sheer instinct, remember autonomy, self-governing. Uh, Charlie shouldn't have done that. He should have moved off somewhere a half a mile or a mile and rented a group on a different night as we do today. You don't hear about people trying to put other people out of business now. Really don't. But with this deep instinct that Tex had, and this, oh, so many years before the traditions, 
He got up with a big smile at our group one night, and he says, Well, I tell you, folks, it's 8.30, and it's time for the regular meeting of the hole in the ground, but up on your feet, boys and girls, we're going to go over and visit good old Charlie. And so we disarmed him completely, because we all tromped into Charlie's meeting, and there we were, hole in the grounders and Charlie's meeting, just one big happy family, and Charlie took one look, the book, and he began to call on us as guests. And then he said to Tex, Hey, old-timer, you know what? Next week we're going to do the same. And he did. And so there was no problem because it was done with love and laughter and a deep instinct to keep this thing going and not fight over it, you know, and it worked. That's just one instance that a group ought to be self-governing and, and not try to do. I heard of a recent instance. This was within the last month. One of our old, well-settled groups, some of the members got unhappy about something or other, and they did go down the street, and they did rent a hall on the same night. I happened to be speaking at this old group. It's been in business over 30 years. And very quietly, the secretary said, we want to wish a new group well, who is now meeting down the street. And so, in order that they may be successful, we are going to change our meeting night to, and he named a Wednesday or a Thursday, we're going to change our meeting night. And that's what they're doing. The 30-year-old group changed its meeting night and wished the new group well. Fine. That's the way we work. Because we don't want to lose anybody, we want to keep growing. And I guess that's the way it always was and will be. Now, actually what we want to do, I think all of us have learned this well, is to carry the message to the alcoholic who uh, still suffers and not get tangled up with any other thing, whatever that may be. The primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. We know this when we work in the central office or when we're in general service, we're trying to carry the message and we're trying to do it the very best that we can. Now, if we didn't do that and we diluted this program and got it tangled up with anything else at all, then it would be a simple dilution, as is mentioned in the 12 and 12. They tried everything in those days. They tried AA hospital. They tried uh, education. For the alcoholics, they had, uh, they not only had a, a hospital, uh, they had educational facilities, and they all flocked. Uh, they built a monumental, great big, uh, several stories, you know, with, uh, education on one floor and a drying out place on the next and meetings on the top story or on the bottom or whatever. And it was diluted. And they found out and they quit doing that. And somehow or other, we pull out of these things. I'll never know exactly how that there hasn't been a major calamity in Alcoholics Anonymous, but there seems not to have been. Uh, most of us who come to meetings now, we hear the traditions read, and we we they may play, not play back at that moment, but but we're aware of them. Uh, for instance, uh, these outside enterprises that we have or have heard of. They never worked permanently. I received a letter in the mail with my full name on it about uh, six months ago asking me to send, uh, oh, a whole bunch of bedding and uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, canned goods and everything. And I had talked in this county before, and, and uh, whoever this person was that had asked me to speak used my full name, said it, and was trying to get some donations for an outside enterprise. And I saw red. I got mad. And I got very angry, and I ran to the telephone, and I was really going to tell him what's what. But I cooled off first. And in fact, I waited two or three weeks. <laughs> and then I called him up and explained that I, I said, you had my name on your list as a speaker, as secretary of a group, and now, now you hit me up for money and goods, wares, and merchandise, and I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And he said, I'm very sorry, Sybil. Well, I'm not sorry that I did that, because... You have to do what you have to do. Like I did at a meeting, the old-timers meeting in Pasadena. And I'm kind of chicken. I'm a timid person. And I went to that meeting, and um, when we got to the door of the old-timers meeting, and I was a participant, I said, uh, hey, Bob, do you have any money? He said, no, you brought the money. And I said, no, I didn't. And we didn't have penny one. And the people at the door said, you can't come in. And I said, yes, we can. And she said, it's two fifty or whatever. No, I said, we didn't bring any money. And we spotted Harry Viberberg. Hey, Harry! He was way down in the back. And Harry came over and gave us five bucks and we paid. The brochure had been put out by some good AA and at the printers they had either lost it up or whoever had printed the brochure didn't really read the copy or, or it didn't register. It said AA meeting and dance, 250. And so when it came my turn to speak, I got up there and I said, well, this is the first time 
that I've ever had to pay to get into an, H, an AA meeting since I was in Bakersfield in 1952. I said, I couldn't get in tonight till somebody came up with a 250. I said, what if a new man had come to the door there and tried to get in and he couldn't get in? He'd say, so they charge for AA. What if a new girl and her husband had come there and couldn't get in? I said, I know it was a mistake, but it ought not to be that way. And I said, the reason that it happened in Bakersfield is that we were doing the 12-step play. And Bakersfield had asked us to come up there and do it, which we did. And I said, when we got up there, these well-meaning people, not knowing anything, the traditions had just come out and nobody was reading them. Nobody wanted to read them. They finally did, of course. And so what Bakersfield had done, they had printed posters saying, Celebrated Hollywood actors will portray the birth of AA. The 12-step play, which Rosa remembers well. Then we did the central office play, and my brother Tex started the 12-step play back in, in the 40s, and Jimmy Burwell was the atheist, and he would play him. And it was a very good thing. It, it, it showed people how the steps were born. We did it in all the groups instead of a regular meeting. But these people had sent their little kids around to barber shops and <laughs> windows in the town there, and they had these placards in every store up and down the coast. And hundreds and hundreds, about 2,000 members had come from far and yon, and horses and buggies and automobiles, trucks, vans, and what have you, and they were parked around the Bakersfield Inn there, and they wanted to see the birth of AA. And I guess everybody in town did. It didn't matter whether you were an alcoholic or not. It was just 250 to get in. So we got there, and in those days, we'd have 12 people. Each one would do one step. You know, would pretend to do a step. I'd be Ruth Hawk, and I'd copy down what they said, and then you'd be Bill Wilson, and Bill would say, Well, now, what's keeping you sober, Sam? And Sam would say, Well, I just had to admit that I couldn't handle booze. And Bill would say, So, you, actually, your life was unmanageable? Yes, Bill, it was. And I'd write it down. What have you got there, Ruth? And I'd read it back. I'm cutting it short, but that's what we do. We'd have 12 guys do this, and I'd be Ruth Hawk. Bill's secretary, and then Jimmy Burwell would stride in and raise hell about the word God, and we'd throw him out, which is just about what happened back there, I think, and Jimmy and Rosa went with us to Palmdale one night when we were doing the play, and Jimmy Burwell, the real Burwell, sat out in the car, and nobody had ever laid eyes on him, and then when we got to the point about throwing out Jimmy Burwell, the fake Jimmy Burwell, who was playing his part, we ran and we raved, and we shoved him out the door. I said, well, the real Jimmy Burwell stand up. And he stood up, and the, the crowd fell apart. Well, now, here it was in Bakersfield, and my troop of actors, some of them been sober half an hour. Isn't that about right, Bob? Have you been sober about a half an hour? <laughs> they began to quote traditions to me and wouldn't go on. Hug, uh, hug, Huglin was one. That's against the tradition, Sib. We can't do that. And I stood there a minute, and I thought about these well-meaning AAs who didn't even know them, know the traditions or anything like that, you know. And I said, I'm going to invoke Rule Z, which the traditions are guide. The members that are in that hall don't know that, that this was done improperly and that the public should not have been invited and, and you know, broke anonymity and all that sort of thing. So I said, this town, they don't know anything about the traditions. So if you guys don't want to be in it, forget it. Just sit down out there in the audience and have a good time. And the rest of us, you guys take two steps apiece and said, once we're going to do the play. And we did. And we threw out Jimmy Burwell as usual. And, and uh, it was a rip-roaring evening. Now, they made money and built their Alano Club out of the proceeds. <laughs> and a year later, they called us up and asked if we'd do the 12-step play again. And I said, yes. If you'll treat it as a regular meeting as we do locally here, we simply get up there and at 8.30, and we're over by 10 o'clock, they pass their hat, and that's it. And they read the traditions and so on. It's a meeting. It's not a financial enterprise. And that's what happened there. And that's what I told them at the Pasadena Old Timers meeting. I said, this is the first time I ever had to pay to get into a meeting since 52. And they held a caucus when that meeting was over of the committee, and they came up to me and thanked me, and I thought they'd throw me out for, for mentioning it. And they don't do that anymore, so we don't mean to do these things. We simply don't. You know, um, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. On attraction, maintain personal anonymity at the le level of press, radio, and film. Um, I heard a speaker say one night, and I believe he was right, and it was at the Big Book Group in Bellflower. He said, we in AA have a bad habit. We don't mean to have this habit. We have a bad habit of killing celebrities, and everybody's jumped. He said, we don't mean to. 
But he says it's a fact. He said the rest of us can enjoy our anonymity and be as anonymous as we choose, not in an AA group, because that's not the way it's supposed to be. But we can be anonymous as anonymous as we choose. But when it comes to our convention or our meeting, the first thing we want to do is to make sure a lot of people show up. So we call the central office and we ask them to send us a celebrity for our speaker. Well, when I was in the central office as executive secretary for 12 years, there was never a day that passed that a letter or a phone call didn't come from Montreal or from Canada or from some other state saying, Sybil, can you get us Mickey Rooney or Jonathan Winters? And I don't know whether they're members or not and couldn't care less. And I'd say no. And then they'd say, well, can you get us so-and-so and so-and-so that I would know would be on the program? And I'd say, well, no, I can't. Well, why not? Well, they choose not to speak. Uh, they they haven't been sober long enough. Oh, well, we want a big house. Yeah, we, we want a lot of people this year. Well, but, gee, I've got a list of speakers here in the speaker book. Here in California, right in this room here today, we got the best speakers in the United States. And there's no doubt of that. Wonderful speakers. But yet, they want the celebrities, and the poor celebrities who've only been sober anywhere from an hour to eight weeks, and eight months, or whatever, they're going flying around all over the country, and they get drunk. They're not able to handle it. They're not able to handle it at all. And so this statement was made at, the, at this Bellflower meeting. I'll tell you who made the statement. It was Bob. And during the coffee break, a fellow in that category came over to me, all sweaty, you know, a lot of sweat and his eyes watering, very well-known man. And he said, uh, well, uh, you're Sybil? And I said, yes. He said, was Bob telling the truth about celebrities? And I said, well, yes, I've seen it happen. He said, well, I had nine months sobriety, and I went on TV and gave my full name and talked about all these things. And I said, what happened? He said, I got drunk. And I said, how long have you been sober now? And he said, seven days. And, oh, I said, I see. And he says, that that really, really got to me. Well, it happens. It happens that actually this is a program of attraction, not promotion. And as I say, you can point the finger at the speakers here today that can fill us full of good AA and and do it a a thousand times better than I ever could, and they can go anywhere in any state in the union and deliver a good message. And we do not have to break the anonymity of a celebrity or ask them to go every time. Now, now, if it so happens that we have celebrities who've been sober uh, long enough to have what it takes to do this and promote it, okay. When I was in the central office, there was a torch singer by the name of Lillian Roth. I, as I say, in, in, in AA, right here, we are not anonymous. It's at the level of press, radio, and film. And I went out to the 6300 Club and made a call on Lillian Roth, and she was a very sick girl, and her husband was there. We spent the afternoon with her. Now then, it wasn't long before that that this thing, I'll Cry Tomorrow, came out, and we had to hire extra people at the central office to take care of the 12-step calls. And the AAs were calling up and saying, isn't it wonderful? We've never had such brisk business. <laughs> and I said, no, it's terrible. And they said, why? And I said, because we, this gal here, no, no matter how, how she means well, and I'm sure she means well. Of course, she, she's an alcoholic and she's sober and she's grateful. But she has broken the anonymity of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it, it never pays off, never. These, these short-term benefits It'll wind up bad some way. It always does. It always does. There is a reason for this thing. Then the movie was made. I tell you, business was booming at the central office. But what happened? And what happened to this poor girl? And God bless her. She may be dead or she may have many years sobriety. And I have no way of knowing. I'm just giving this as an example. She was stoned in Las Vegas publicly. And then the, the view that we have so many of us, at least, is that there would be a sick girl, many sick girls, looking at TV, reading newspapers, and would hear about that and would say, ah, that thing doesn't work. My God, my God, after all the money she made out of that book and that movie, and she could do anything she wanted to, and now she's drunk, and ah, that thing doesn't work. It just isn't the way to handle it to go public. And those that do not know, we try to tell them that we are anonymous at the level of press, radio, and films, and TV, and give everybody the shot at staying sober. Because we know that some people get drunk afterwards. Not because they're on TV, but just because the percentages run that way. At any rate, 
Twelve-step calls for lifeblood of Alcoholics Anonymous are as important to me today as they were then. There are many ways of doing 12-step work. It seems to me that the, the people who are active in AA, time has nothing to do with it. I don't go out and make the 12-step calls that I used to, but I'm certainly willing. And I, I think the people that I know here in this audience whose lives were saved in the early days, and Jim, Jim was a participant in that, Jim Valiant, this fellow I told you who came along long distance here today and one of the original Hole in the Grounders. I was present one night. Now, when the Saturday evening post died down, there wasn't any work for the, for the group. And so Tex would do this. He called up Jim one night and he said, Hey, Jim, will you get in your car and go over and pick up Red Toothman and go see a guy at 257 West 104th Street? Okay, Tex. And so Tex sits there chuckling, and an hour or two later, the phone rings, and it's Jim Valiant and Red Toothman. Hey, Tex, we were out here, and we had to find a payphone. There's nothing here but a vacant lot. And Tex would say, oh, gee whiz, did I say West 104th? I'm at East 104th. Get right on over and see that guy. He's very sick. And he'd run those guys around all night. And they'd be together, and they'd be sober. And that was a 12-step call. We have to do something when we ran out of them. <laughs> what we did, really, is we had guest books, and we would go around in cars and go around and make the same 12-step calls over and over, and we got, got to where the new person, sitting there sometimes gurgling away, would say, sign in, please, because they'd say, Joe Blow just left. Oh, my God, we'd look to be eight or ten that had just been there, and the coffee pot would be on, and the drunk was having a good time. They never had so much company in their lives. <coughs> Maybe we don't get as many 12-step calls as we did then, but it died down from the Saturday evening post naturally, and we had more publicity later on. But it kept us sober, and we did try to carry the message to the best of our ability, and oh my God, the mistakes we made. And the traditions came out, nobody would read them, came out in 45 in the grapevine. And from all these experiences that happened here and all over our land, all over America, all wherever there was a, a terrible mistake, terrible tragedies, I can't remember any... Anyone dying from these terrible mistakes? Maybe somebody did. But from this welter of experience, now we have these guidelines. No rules, but just guidelines. And we abide by them. We believe in them. And we read them. And we act upon them. And I can't begin to tell you what a privilege it has been for me to be here today and try to dredge up some of these experiences that we had about our 12-step calls. The only one thing that I will leave you with is that the two things that we were forbidden to talk about was money and God. We didn't talk about money. Now, the seventh tradition says that we're self-supporting through our own contributions. Well, a lot of people didn't know that in the early days, and they'd start a group, and they'd brag about the church. The minister told us we could have it free, and we were not self-supporting. And they'd say, oh, the minister said we'd have it free, so they'd have lovely ice cream and cake that they bought with their money because they didn't have anything else to do with it. But it came about that we knew that we had to pay our way, pick up the tab, the seventh tradition. But we didn't talk about money at first because we were afraid the guy or the girl who came in would be broken and would be embarrassed. And we'd simply nonchalantly say we're going to pay something for this hall here in the refreshment. And as we pass the baskets, the new people uh, just avoid the baskets. You don't put anything in. Take some out if you need it. And that's the way we handled that. And Cliff Walker has said a thousand and one times we didn't talk about God. He was underground because we figured that 80% of the people had lost any faith that they ever had, if they'd ever had any, and that some of them were atheist or agnostic like Bob. And so we wouldn't talk about God, except during, um, oh, later in our homes or somewhere. I started to say during the coffee break, but we didn't have coffee breaks. No, that was a bone of contention for a long time. But we couldn't talk about God. But then they'd begin to count the number of times that God was mentioned in the big red book. And they'd come and they'd add them up 946 times, though it's 743. And then gradually the word God came into being. And they, then the members waxed more spiritual as their sobriety progressed. And then heaven knows, and someone ought to tell me, 10 or 15 years ago we got to holding hands when we prayed. What a far cry from 1939, 40, and 41 when I came in when we couldn't talk about God. And we've never seen a newcomer run away yet because we hold hands. He just puts his hands out there, and he, and he just holds hands, and we pray, and it gives us extra strength. But we couldn't do that then. But Bill and Dr. Bob did. Ruth Hawk told us when she was out here two years ago, she said, I'm not churchy and I'm not religious, but I'd be sitting there typing away on the big book, and a wet drunk would come up the stairs, and Bill would kneel down with a wet drunk right at my desk, and I could hardly type. And... <laughs> 
They didn't care. They were very... They happened to be that way. They started off that way. They put it in the book that way, and it took us a little while we dragged our feet. But we don't drag our feet now. And, of course, the reason that I'm here today is because my God sustains me daily. And you do, too. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.